this month, a brand new book came out documenting the rise of Marvel Studios and the MCU. How are actors cast? How do they develop stories? What are the troubles behind the scenes? It talks about all of it. But is it worth your time? Let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and Marvel way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Let me know, what did you think about the book if you've been able to check it out? For me, I've been a fan of the MCU since day one when Iron Man came out. And then this YouTube channel right here grew essentially covering MCU Phase 3. Marvel, in many pretty real senses, changed the trajectory of my life. So the idea that they put out a book that documents the backstory is both something that's interesting to me, but it also informs this all so much about this franchise that both I love and that has been so important to my career. Now, if you're like me and you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, you can get this book for free by signing up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. I actually listened to the audiobook and I got about a quarter of the way through it and realized I was taking so many notes elsewhere that I decided to just buy a physical copy of the book so I could highlight the important passages, things like that that I wanted to reference in the future. But I'm a massive fan of Audible. That's how I read most of my books. And they have this book on there. So if you want to check it out for free, the link is down below in the description. You go to audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler and you get all sorts of behind the scenes stories on Marvel. Or if you want something else, you can get any other book in their library for free, plus a 30 day free trial of Audible. With that said, let's get started with the good. And I'll just cut right to the chase on this one. I think that this is a must read for any long-term MCU fan. If this is a franchise that you love, whether you're still thinking it's as good as it's ever been, if you're frustrated by phase four and five, wherever you're at, if you're someone that loves the MCU or loved the MCU, this is a book I highly recommend you check out simply because it's very, very thorough. It goes all the way back to kind of the, the history of Marvel in short, but then kind of tracking where did Marvel Studios come from? The specific producers that came about that were so responsible for certain rights acquisitions, certain franchises happening. It tracks Kevin Feige and his origin story from being a kid to being like a, an assistant on the set of X-Men to then becoming a producer and how his role changed, what kind of shaped him, the moment where he really got into comic books themselves, how all of that, all of that came about. And then from there, it just tracks the history. Whether talking about how they got the funding, how the casting was done, and you realize all these little anecdotes of the way that this person in phase three got cast was that they tried out for a role in phase one and then they just wrote their name down. They went, keep coming back to this person. We'll find the part eventually. They said all these great little anecdotes about where things, where each of these roles came about. One of the things that was really interesting to me, and I'll probably make a separate video about this. I've got a ton of notes written for it already and a lot of sections from this book um, highlighted for this purpose, but it tracks a bunch of things that made that made phase one so successful and the way they ran things that probably are a big part of why they're struggling right now. And it doesn't overtly state this, but you know, business practices and things like that. You talk about how what got you here isn't necessarily what you need to get here. The things that make you successful at one size are what holds you back at the next stage. And I think you're seeing a lot of that right now in the book in so many ways informs kind of unintentionally, but informs so much of what I've been my issues with the MCU over the last years and gives specific examples of how things are run, how things shifted. And it gives the stories behind what changed 
and a little bit of almost the luck that it worked in the first place. There's so much brilliance that took place, but there are all these gambles and risks that could have gone horribly wrong, but it was just kind of lightning in a bottle, the right moment, the right time. And you get all of that. You get the celebration, you get the victories, you get these moments where they really took a risk of quotes about how we will never, like Robert Downey Jr. is definitely not the front runner. It's like all these things that sound crazy 15 years later, but at the time they actually made sense. And it's just jam packed with those little anecdotes all along the way. One of the things that also does really well is it it does touch on all the movies in the first three phases and it, it, it doesn't do it quite as much when you get into phase four because it's, it's more recent. But in the first run, it, it does. But it, it finds a way to not just be like, chapter eight, Iron Man. Chapter nine, Incredible Hulk. It does that kind of during phase one, but after that, it starts being a little bit more thematic. And what are kind of the big chunks that's an idea to discuss and so it doesn't get repetitious in the way that it plays out there are a couple times i was like really we're skipping over this movie really and then jump forward and in a different section where it, it highlights an idea it unpacks it and you understand oh you're holding off on talking about thor the dark world because it was going to come back later talking about this section over here but there were just so many different things that it talked about that maybe i'd heard murmurs about at some point in time, but were this huge piece that had big gigantic ramifications for the MCU as a whole. And there are other things that were, that we've kind of forgotten about, or I'd forgotten about. Like during phase two, Joss Whedon was kind of the, the creative lead of the MCU that did a polish on every script and things like, I knew that at the time, but because essentially since my channel started, by the time I started my channel, he'd moved on to DC and then more recently, has moved out of favor with everyone for obvious reasons, but we've kind of forgotten these little pieces of history that were so crucial and it, it captures all of it. Whether you're like me that was tracking this along, but so much has happened that you forgot about it. Or if you're younger and you joined the MCU during phase three or phase four, it kind of reminds you of the history of a lot of the things that took place all along the way. Other thing that it does that I wasn't quite as expecting it to do as in depth as it did, but it, it like really goes into a lot of these other projects, Cloak and Dagger, Runaways, and their backstory of how the projects originated in this creative group that they ran 13 years ago. And then as that dissolved and things shifted and certain people didn't think, think things would sell toys, now it shifted in a different direction. And just, there's a lot of things like that that were just really interesting. This whole section on the Marvel Netflix shows goes going into far more detail than I was expecting on them and discussing why they were treated the way that they were for a long time and how there, there was a shift in thinking and why the shift in thinking changed at a specific point in time and how different things rubbed people in different ways. It, it kind of covers all of it all the way up until even this year. I mean, it considering that books, generally speaking, have a pretty long turnaround since you have to physically print a thing and edit them and everything like that. But I mean, it talks about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania, talks about Jonathan Majors and his, the trouble that they're running into with um, the trials and stuff like that. It touches on it. Doesn't get anything into the release of Guardians 3. It talks about the, the past stuff, but not the release of it. So you can see the cutoff date for updates to it was like April 1st or something like that. Because of that, but it, that means we have a pretty definitive history that covers almost all of it through the kickoff of phase five. And a lot of details on the behind the scenes of No Way Home and how things were done. I mean, just very thorough, a lot of great little anecdotes and just informing you behind the scenes. Especially like when I do my rankings, I like to have as much of that flavor of just a deeper knowledge of how this film came about. And the behind the scenes on their, their Blu-rays don't have that. <laughs> they don't really give you the deep dive in that sense to inform you of the hiccups. They're more like puff pieces. And this is the book that I've essentially been waiting for 
that fills in the gaps, lets you know what went on behind the scenes and the culture and all of that. So for me, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I suspect that this will be a book that I'll, I'll be re-listening to most years to prep for up rankings and other things like that, to just have that deeper dive and knowledge of these films, of these TV shows, and of this franchise that has meant so much to me. So if you're into behind the scenes, if you're into the MCU, I really, really do recommend checking this out. That said, there are some frustrations here, so let's move on to the bad. And probably the biggest obstacle that this book runs into is that as it states early on, Disney eventually told people to stop accepting interviews for the purpose of the book. They were able to interview tons and tons of people, but at some point in time, apparently Disney said, hey, don't respond to interviews for this book. Uh, I would assume as they realized that the book wasn't going to just paint Disney as an awesome and a hero. It's going to air out dirty laundry. There's all kinds of stuff in here that makes a lot of people look really bad, there's all sorts of parts in it where they talk about, hey, maybe Kevin Feige is spread a little bit too thin. It's missing what was there before. There's a little bit of that editorializing. There's certainly things where they talk about choices that Disney made and shareholders and Marvel, um, Marvel in New York, like not just Marvel Studios, but Marvel, the full company, made some choices that are just not good. There's a lot of people that were employed that were blatantly racist and sexist and said some things where you're like, oh, wow, that's not good. And they're in the book, which actually all of this stuff that I'm saying right now, this is a positive. This is one more positive that it's in there. But because at some point in time, Disney cut off some of those interviews, you feel a pretty big shift in the, the quality of the analysis and maybe behind the scenes, it feels different the further back you go. The further away from now and Disney you get, feels like the more honest it is. And the more you can have a direct interview with someone that'll just kind of tell you what happened. And then as you move into, especially more recently, there's a lot more stuff where it feels like um, we're pulling from all the same articles that I've read and I've referenced in things before. Some things that maybe are rumor mill a little bit and it's not quite as strong and primary source. Like, talking directly to the person that did a thing because Disney said, stop doing these interviews. So then it feels a little bit more speculative and less concrete and sometimes not as deep diving into what happened. And that's sometimes the advantage of anything that's older. It's easier to own a 15 year old mistake than a 15 day old mistake. <laughs> now, Disney doesn't want to admit they're doing something wrong now. Like, yeah, sure, 20 years ago we made a mistake. Right now, it's tough to do that because you're still in the middle of it. And that, I think, feels that's kind of a lot of that is in this book. A couple other things. Um, I, I mentioned how they organize things a little bit thematically where it's not just this repetition, then they did this movie, then they did this movie. It gets thematic and we'll pause to talk about TV shows and we'll talk about how they cast people and by that we'll cover some of these other things. And with that, it can feel a little bit in its own way jumbled where we start covering into phase three and we like deep, like we're talking end game and then it goes back and we start talking about Thor Ragnarok. And you're like, what? Uh, uh. There's a little bit of that that, once again, the first big chunk of it pre-Disney is very chronological and you're just following a more singular narrative. And then it really branches out and gets a little bit disorganized. And there's some of those, there's things like that that just inherently when you're tackling so much and you don't want it to be repetitious and you want to cover everything, it, it can get a bit jumbled and certain things get repeated because we're, we're talking about this movie that falls into this category and then it falls into this one. So there's even like sentences that feel like they were copied and pasted at times because we're just getting us back acclimated to talking about a specific movie. There's a few things like that. They're a little bit odd. And then I think there's, it's a, 
book that's not primarily designed to editorialize and give opinions. It's designed to be a history. And so when it does, it feels a little bit out of place. There's a couple times where instead of talking about, you know, it wasn't well reviewed or it's one of the lower reviewed films, it states it as in the like the author's opinion. There's times where it kind of touches on some politics and choices and stuff that it just feels like we're, we're leaning away from we're just documenting something to we're getting into opinion pieces. And some of that, it just felt odd. It felt out of place. And that's not really what the book is as a whole. So every time you do it and you phrase it that way, it pulls me out of the narrative. I'm like, well, well I, well, I disagree with that. And we're do, talk, documenting a history, telling the story of something. There's not supposed to be anything I disagree with. <laughs> so when you say it in a way that makes me disagree, it's a little bit odd. So, but these are minor gripes. Finally, we have a history of the MCU that's accessible and also on Audible. Last year, Disney did put out their own official history of the MCU. I did buy it. It's two massive, massive coffee table books. It is thorough. It is exhaustive. It goes into a lot of the behind the scenes stuff itself. But first off, it's not on Audible, so I can't listen to it. Second off, it's over $100. So it's, it's, it's like a premium item. Uh, they're not even, when you have books this size, they're not the easiest to read. So I've only read about half of it thus far. And before I could finish this one, which was tough to get through, a new one came out that probably is more critical of the MCU, which is helpful and good. So I greatly, greatly appreciate that this exists and that it's, it's affordable. You can actually, a normal person that is, can, can buy this rather than like, I do this for a living, so I can buy a $100 coffee table Marvel book but normal people can actually afford this one. And if you sign up for a free trial of Audible, you can get it for free at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. But as I've now said many times in here, I really do recommend this to all MCU fans and anyone that's just into the behind the scenes of movies and want to understand this thing that is so dominant in the current world of movies. This is the story of it that is accessible. It's interesting and I will be re-listening to it probably every single year. Thanks so much for watching and keep talking movies and Marvel too much. Bye-bye.